the things that we really want to start off with is actually just talking about the future of JavaScript and talking about the way that uh, the web and the environment is evolving. Um, so one of the first questions I wanted to start with was um, when it comes to ECMAScript TC39, things, things seem to be moving at a sort of an unprecedented pace recently. Um, and it'd be interesting to hear from you. Um, do you think that the focus that they've had, do you think that the, the things they're focusing on now, do you think that's the right area? Do you think there are things that should be doing more of or less of in this particular area? I mean, Doug, is, um, do you want to start there? From my perspective, it's actually kind of slow that, um, <laughs> that the sixth edition came out almost three years later than was intended. Yeah. And that was because the process kept adding more and more new stuff um, and that slowed everything down. The consequence of that was that some of the good stuff that's in ES6, like uh, proper tail calls and, and the ellipsis operator, that stuff has been held up, and I really want that. Yeah. Um, and that got delayed for other things, which I think are much less desirable. Yeah. Um, the, the plan is that going forward, they're going to stop doing that and instead try to stick to a schedule, and any features that are not sound by the time they reach the publication date, that stuff doesn't get published, rather than delaying everything and then inviting more stuff to come in and fill the yeah. delay time. And you think that's broadly the right approach? To it's a better approach. Yeah, yeah I, would, I would largely agree. I, I think it make, it's true. I actually joined TC39 uh, probably after the first time TC39 thought that we would ship the S6 and probably three years or something before we actually ship the S6. So I, I completely agree. And I, I think interestingly, uh, the group of people that joined after I joined basically spent the next three years saying, can we stop doing this crazy process? Um, and I think the, the new members all were very eager to get on the new process. I think one thing that's, that's important to note about the new process, which I think, I think Doug basically got right here, um, is that the new process doesn't just say, you know, there's this binary idea of the feature is ready, and you know, we put our stamp on it, and now it's done. Which, and, and I think if you look at ES6, there's tons of features that are done, but actually aren't in any browser. And that's actually really scary, because maybe, we'll, maybe when the browsers start implementing them, we'll, it will turn out that we got it wrong. Um, so uh, the way the new process works is that when features come out, they basically get approved as sort of interesting. Um, so you, that's stage zero. Committee thinks it's a good idea. Uh, stage one basically means something like uh, there's a, tr a valid transpiler for it. Users are using it. People, there's uh, good, promising signs this is a good idea. We have actual spec text for it. Um, and then stage two is uh, browsers are actually really implementing this. People, uh, it's, it's for real, but it's still behind a flag in a browser. Um, and then stage three is maybe uh, browsers are starting to take it out behind the flag. And stage four is, okay, now that all the browsers have taken it out from behind the flag, it, lo it's, it looks good. We can, we can say that it's, you know, two browsers have implemented it and we know it's good. And only once a feature has actually reached stage four will it get into the next version of, of ECMAScript. But again, it doesn't mean that there's nothing happening between them. There's, you know, a Babel transpiler or polyfill step. There's a step of, the, of browsers actually shipping it behind the flag. There's the step of browsers shipping it not behind the flag. Um, and I think uh, historically we just haven't had, we've had this like big binary thing and it mostly has existed in, in the land of thought. And I think getting things into the land of practice is good. Yeah, that's a great point. So, I mean, in terms of the, the ES 2016, this sort of next version that they're looking at here, um, there are a number of things that are being considered. Are there any particular highlights for you? Are there things that people should be sort of keeping an eye on? Things that you think are really going to have an impact? I mean, I think the bad news is ES 2016 is going to be a small release. Um, and, and really, ES 2016 is the first release of the new process. And so what that means is that there's this weird, ES 2016 was a bunch of stuff. So we'll have, I think we'll get like the exponentiation operator. Um, and I don't, there may be some things like the ellipsis operator for objects. So um, you can do a dot, dot, dot uh, in, a, in parameter position or arrays, but um, Facebook, uh, uh, pioneered this in React and, and pushed it on the committee, and I think it's simple enough that it might make it into ES 2016, is the ability to basically say, here's a bunch of defaults to smash into this object. Um, so there's going to be a few things like that, but I think broadly, because the new rules are no longer, right, ES 2015 was, okay, anything that made it in before the deadline, no matter whether it exists in the real world, is done. But ES 2016 is, you have to actually have shipped it in two browsers. Obviously, that means that there's a, you know, the first release is going to be relatively thin. 
Um, but, I, but I think that's a good thing. It's basically kickstarting the process of actually being honest about what's happening instead of pretending like all we have to do at STC39 is put a rubber stamp on it and it's done. Is there anything that sticks out for you, Doug? Um, that should be that coming soon. I mean, think of things like uh, a lot of people are quite excited about sort of async await, um, about some, uh, about um, dealing with some of the asynchronicity issues in JavaScript a little differently. Uh, I, I see a lot of really fuzzy thinking about asynchronicity. Asynchronicity is wonderful and important. It's in fact how the universe works, and it's also how programs should work. And the thing that I don't like about await and some of the other tricks is that they're trying to hide asynchronicity so that you don't have to change the way you think about programming in order to live in a world that's asynchronous. And I, I, I think that's probably not good, that you need to understand and embrace and respect asynchronicity because that's one of the most important fundamental concepts going forward. Yeah, so I don't agree, but not. But I agree with Doug's premise, actually. I, I agree that uh, one of the best things that JavaScript has going for it uh, that make it better than a lot of other languages I've written uh, concurrent code in is that JavaScript is honest about the fact that two things, that, that you can't just block randomly. You can't, you can't accept a node, as Doug pointed out uh, yesterday. You can't just say, you know, stop the world, and then I'll move on to do something else later. You have to be honest about, about asynchron asynchronicity. Um, and I, the idea, so async await actually may make it, although there's been some, as usual, uh, things have come up recently that make it non-obvious. But um, I think the, the key thing to understand about await is just that await is not, await is not saying pretend this is synchronous. Um, await is saying this is a, an opportunity that, that you have to go on and do something else. So um, unlike if you wrote like a Ruby program, and in a Ruby program, you said, like, read from this, from this file, let's say, and that, that happened to be synchronous. There would not be any uh, asynchronous. There would not be any clue in your program. So you would say, you know, file.read, and that might take five seconds. And there wouldn't be any clue in your program that that might take five seconds. And that's, I think, in, indeed a very bad thing and something that uh, Doug is right for saying is bad. Um, but, I, but a wait is, is the way of you saying, okay, I know that this operation may take time and I'm gonna allow you to go on and do something else in the meantime. And you're still sure that if you didn't write the word await, nothing can actually stop. So it's a way of actually tell, of, of hinting to your, yourself and to future readers that this is a place where something else can happen in between. And the nice thing about it is that in no other place can something happen in between. So even if you write a, a wait a lot of times, maybe you wrote a wait in a program of a thousand lines 50 times, that's still 950 lines that, that can't have anything happening in between. So, I mean, is, uh, Christian, earlier you talked a little bit about um, React and Flux and this idea of sort of um, bringing some of the ideas of functional programming into the client, into JavaScript. And it seems that, again, in the same way that um, there's been a lot of change in JavaScript in the last couple of years, the idea of sort of functional programming has really, um, again, from my perspective, anyway, from maybe, maybe it's my ignorance, um, has really started to, fi to find um, a lot of love from a lot of people. I mean, mm -hmm. it had for a very long time, but in the JavaScript community in particular. Um, is that something you found sort of useful in your own day to day? It is. I think it's it's very useful. Um, patterns like functional composition, you know, of objects in React, um, are pretty easy to reason about. Uh, they're straightforward. Um, they're not generally hidden inside a, a an engine level implementation detail. Um, they're very well exposed. But it's not it's not an either or thing. I um, and that's the interesting thing. JavaScript has always been a multi-paradigm language. There have always been people trying to use it to do traditional, classical, object-oriented things. There have always been people trying to use it to do um, uh, more functional kinds of things, whether they meant to or not. And now, increasingly, the Node community is, is expanding the concerns a great deal and causing people to bring a lot more sophistication to the question. I think the important thing to me is we spend a lot of our time talking to uh, CIOs and CTOs and other people who run large engineering organizations. Those people clearly like and have comfort with um, strengthening both paradigms. Some of them think that tail calls are the bomb. Not many of them seem to think it's going to change the way they work tomorrow. 
whereas a lot of people, um, I'm not a huge fan of the new hard classes, harder classes, but people in large organizations love them because it's familiar, it's comfortable. It yeah. tells them that this is a language to be reckoned with because it has the features that I expect from the other languages that I think are serious and legitimate. Um, and so we're growing, growing our language and growing our community at, from all sides, yeah. and in particular um, in how respectable it is to you know, the big guys, to the enterprises. <laughs> sure. So I mean, on that point, should we um, take a couple of uh, questions from the audience? Um, if you want to put your hand up, as Amit mentioned, um, someone will come to you with a mic, um, but please wait for the mic to get to you uh, so we can make sure that we can have it on the uh, recording when you ask a question. So first person to ask a question. Anyone, guys? Anyone at all? So uh, what we can do is then we can quickly um, go on to something else. I mean, one of the things that's kind of interesting at the moment is um, the amount of focus that browser vendors are putting on to performance um, in terms of uh, creating the web as, an, um, as sort of a level playing field deployment platform with things like WebAssembly, with this idea of being able to um, uh, stack up JavaScript and stack up the web runtime um, to be a compa to be comparable with other runtimes, like with gaming in it, for example, with um, like with um, a the, with ASM and pointing Unreal Engine into WebGL. I mean, do you think that that is that's a that's a useful time? That's a useful thing um, for browser vendors to be spending a lot of their investment. I mean, you talked a little bit yesterday about well, yeah. let's take a step back and say actually we need to rethink this a little more. Obviously, better. of course not. I mean. How many of you have customers or management who want you to be putting games into your applications? I'm guessing anybody? <laughs> who needs game technology in, in your applications? It, so it, it, it's a distraction, right? We're, instead of doing things that the web really needs, we're going to be chasing video games, which is fun. I'm, I used to be in the video game business, and it really is fun. And being able to write video games in JavaScript would be fun too, but I don't think it does the web any good at all. I don't, I don't really think WebAssembly is about, I mean, it has a nice side effect of letting you port video games, and maybe that's somebody's motivation, but I don't think that's how we should think about it. Um, I, I think the goals that people who, are, who want to use WebAssembly and previously Asm.js to, to advance the web are mostly about, uh, Remove, there's sort of a last frontier on the web about things that require native performance. So things that require native performance are not just games, but they're things like uh, really common things like ungzipping files. So if you want, let's say you want to implement a, a, an HTTP client in the platform. Let's say the platform. Let's say you're you're building Doug's new thing. Uh, you're building Doug's new thing, and you want to build uh, some some fast uh, some fast protocol. Um, you act, you really do want the ability to run code at uh, close to native speeds, and while JavaScript might be fast, it is very fast. And I th and I, I I had it on a slide, right? JavaScript isn't slow anymore. JavaScript speed is unpredictable, and and I think um, I don't see, think there's anything wrong with wanting to basically say we're not going to be we're not going to tie the platform necessarily at the lowest levels to a, an unpredictable performance. If somebody wants to go and do something really crazy, maybe that's going to mean something like Doug's proposal, but maybe it will mean something like porting Haskell to, to JavaScript. Maybe it means something like porting, uh, I, I meant to the web, or, or porting Ruby to the web. Those things are, are not really about games. It's more about making the, lower, the lowest levels of the platform um, have less overhead. And I think that that's OK. Um, I, I think that it's, it's really easy to, uh, it's really, I mean, JavaScript is great. Uh, I like JavaScript. But I, I think if you want, <laughs> Ironically, I think if you really want big changes, if you want to try really big things, you really want a, you want access to the lowest levels. The the uh, this community has a has a way of trying things on for size and finding out whether they add any value or not. Um, I think some of the stuff we're talking about falls into that category. Some of it might be a glorious experiment that fails, but we'll definitely learn something interesting from it. Um, I know that we are seeing, I think we're seeing the first signs of, um, as things push forward, people's expectations keep rising and rising and rising. You know, what's the next wave for something like Google Maps? Well, it's the ability to do 
free exploration in a map, which means that you need to be able to render it as a full virtual environment, not just a series of tiles that you zoom in and out on and you know there's a tile around you. You could do that in QuickTime 3D in like the 90s. Um, so I think that there are actual contexts where things that we think of right now currently as gaming technology, the ability to virtualize environments, um, there is there is a clear emergent business case for those. The question is just how do you do it? Which one of these things actually makes that possible? And whether the browser is the best place to do it. But right now, I think the browser is clearly the best place to do it. it it's how we um, put something like Google Maps in front of the greatest number of people the most quickly um, and, and let anybody show up on any given day and engage with this amazing little piece of content that we created that, that teaches them something about the world. So we are hitting certain limits. Being in a, a purely text-based world um, or a purely uh, small vectors-based world is a, is a limit. Um, and, and we are bumping up against some of that when, when we try to do interesting things. Yeah. Absolutely. I mean, one thing I'd also like to talk to you guys about um, is this idea of um, uh, frameworks have become a huge part of the way people build web applications, um, Ember, Angular, Aurelia, React, um, whatever they may be. Um, what's really interesting is that some of the ideas that some of the things they really uh, existed previously was sort of plumbing reasons, right? Like the idea of the um, uh, like uh, the event loop in um, Angular and the idea that you couldn't actually bind objects in state. And now with object observe, that becomes slightly unnecessary with web components and building components. So based on that kind of idea of sort of the things that have classically been the home, uh, in the home of these um, frameworks moving further and further down the stack, do you think that the context for frameworks is going to change? Um, do you think the things they're going to do, is it going to be purely around the idea of convention you talked about earlier for actually helping people build applications quickly, helping them structure them? Or do you think that it's, there's always going to be a place when that context is going to change a little bit? I mean, does Doug want to start? Mm. Okay, I, I'm happy. So, yeah, I, I think a lot of that stuff will end up, a lot of the stuff that you talked about will end up ultimately feeling wrong um, in a few years. Object.observe is already probably going to take a much slower path than perhaps some people had thought. Um, web components are also taking a slower path. There are pieces of like HTML imports yeah. that are just not probably, I mean, Mozilla has said they don't want to implement it. Um, and I, I think there was, an, a, it was a sort of an attempt by Google since, since, around, since around 2011, actually, to try to bring, frame, to make the browser have a framework. And I think what, what perhaps people learned was that there's a lot of hubris in assuming that the sort of the, 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 the foundation, the platform that we stand on is stable enough to actually put a framework into the, into the platform. I think React is a pretty good example of something that shook things up. But even, even if you discount React, basically every framework did things a little bit differently. And, and if you go, uh, one of the things that I like to do is I like to go meet with other frameworks. So uh, pretty much everybody has been doing this recently. And we had a meeting recently. Uh, uh, we meet pretty much all the time with React now that they're on TC39, but I've also met with well, Angular. And pretty much every time we have these meetings, we talk about web components and we say, basically no framework wants to use web components as the base because there's just some way in which we have drifted away from what someone in 2011 decided a web component would be. Mm -hmm. um, and I, I, maybe I'm the first person saying that out loud uh, on stage, but I think it is definitely the case that trying to build something very high level frameworky in the platform is really risky. And uh, the platform is better, uh, I wrote the extensive web manifesto a few years ago Got a lot of signatures. People like it, I think. Um, and the, the idea behind that was that instead of trying to put frameworks in the browser, we should try to build primitives in the browser that enable frameworks to do more stuff. And I think, um, I think we're very unlikely to reach a point where, like we are with jQuery, right? jQuery is stable. You can imagine putting something like jQuery in the browser, but it's hard to imagine putting either Ember, or Angular, or React's component model in the browser. The, um, I, there's a lot of things I'm trying to uh, digest, dollar digest them all. Um, the, uh, I think, you know, on the one hand, we have this vision of the, of the future in which, um, you know, there might be another web, a, a web 2.0, which is exciting. The web 1.0 that we have now, we're doing great innovative things in, and I, I think 
as Yehuda said, the low level, the primitives, the fundamentals are really where we've got the most traction, where people can agree, um, and where that allows us to make the most progress. So the, the question I heard is, well, what does that mean next for frameworks? Does that mean frameworks adopt web components, or does it mean they do something else? Um, and the trend I see lately is of frameworks, instead of creating their own abstractions, uh, frameworks and other tools, frameworks bundle up um, constructive workflows based on smaller, lower level tools. So right now, React lacks a framework, right? Somebody somewhere is going to do something that bundles up React and a bunch of other great little node tools into something that they're not replacing those things. They're not creating necessarily any new glue code for them. They're just saying, this is the, this is the easiest possible way to build cool stuff fast and effectively out of these tools. So Yeoman is a great example of this. Yeoman just takes existing stuff that was already there on the web, Grunt, Gulp, all these individual little node modules, and builds a great virtuous workflow out of them and abstracts that away from you, not by creating new weird leaky abstractions, but just by putting them together and saying, here you go. So there, it's the OEM model of, of software development. You know, take a bunch of other people's components, push them out. Somebody recently took Yeoman to the next level. If anybody can remember the name, tell me. And they sort of wrapped a Yeoman-style workflow into, I don't know if it's a binary or what, but they, they hide all of the complexity of needing to use NPM and Bower and all of this other stuff. You get the same output, but um, and it's based on those same components that we know and love that are really well written, that are small, that are simple, that are uh, the Unix philosophy. But they make it simpler to interact with. They make it a, a bit more of a black box. Um, and so the, the more we get into the Node ecosystem in particular, the more we bring that into the browser, the easier it gets to take all of this great stuff that people have already done and simply bundle it up, OEM it into solutions. Um, rather than creating new abstractions that uh, get us in trouble. There's sort of a related trend here. <clears throat> so I talked about the web as a compiled medium, mm. and that's sort of similar to what you're talking about. I think one of the interesting things about, about web components and um, even things like uh, JavaScript is that increasingly uh, people aren't waiting for, for the web to bring things in. Pretty much every, I guess Angular will still have uh, templates that get parsed on the client side, but both Ember and, and React do uh, template parsing and compilation on the, on the server side. If React wants to call it a template or not, it's still a template. Yeah. Um, uh, but, the, but there's an increasing amount of the workflow that actually exists outside the browser um, with the idea that maybe if, we, maybe if we could do more work ahead of time, we could save some work that doesn't have to be done on the client. And this is, of course, the way that pretty much every native platform works. Every native platform has some kind of compilation step, which takes some work that you might have to do every time you boot the app and pushes it to the time when you deploy the application. And I, and I think that that trend is actually a big part of what makes uh, these things, makes web components work less well in the, in the platform. Because if React and Ember are basically pre-compiling or doing a lot of work that the, DOM, the HTML parser would do in the client, it's really hard to see how, it's not even clear that there's a, a meeting point for uh, all these things, right? Because we're not even, the, the H, interestingly, the HTML, the HTML is no longer the meeting point. The meeting point is actually DOM, right? Mm -hmm. The meeting point is, is the, uh, an element or an attribute. And, and so it's, it's, I think we're going to see like a, we're going to see a ton of innovation over the the next some number of years in the framework level. But I think it's I think the more like the more the browsers have done a really amazing job of just exposing low level stuff. And I think we're in a in a digesting period right now. <laughs> Dollar digest uh, digesting period where we're trying to see you know what the user land things that we can do with those abstractions are. Those primitives. I think we may have one question. Yay. <laughs> um, so in my previous job, we were working on uh, uh, porting a legacy C++ system to, to JavaScript using mscripten. So uh, what is your take on mscripten, and uh, do you think uh, uh, we should work on porting legacy systems, or do you think we should start from scratch? Was the C++ system really good, or was it crap? 
Because <laughs> I've seen both kinds of C++. Most of it's crap. Um, and, and so if your idea is just to take the crap and automatically put it into a browser, I think that's probably not a good idea. It's a, it's a CAD software, Autodesk. Uh -huh. <laughs> Seems <laughs> hard. I think they may have answered your question. Um, I mean, I'm interested here, because it sort of comes back to the point you made earlier about transpiling, about this idea of the web as a sort of a transpile target uh, for a lot of things. Um, so, I mean, is that something that um, you see as valuable? Is that something that you see um, uh, moving forward much more in the future? Uh, yeah, so I think the web has a really hard constraint that people don't talk about a lot, but is really important, which is that when you click on a link on Google and go to a website, you expect that website to load fast. And maybe if it's a game, you could tolerate you know, a few seconds. But you, even if it's a game, you can't tolerate 30 seconds or a minute on a website. Um, and what that hard constraint means is that people are forced to do clever and cleverer things to make boot time fast. So some of that has to do with loading things asynchronously or loading things on demand as you uh, encounter some area. Uh, but some of it has to do with doing more work ahead of time, doing more work on the server. Um, and I, one thing that's kind of interesting is that so, uh, a lot of the time you can actually get better performance uh, across the board actually by precompiling HTML or precompiling JavaScript um, because you can when you sort of throw it at the browser you're sort of at, uh, it's at the browser's whims exactly how they're going to process the thing that you gave it and, and maybe some browsers you may even get into a situation where you know, one browser says you have to do it exactly this way to get the right performance, and some other browser says you have to do the exact opposite thing to get the right performance. Uh, and this is, a, this is a real phenomenon that exists, that happens when you build uh, JavaScript or, or DOM stuff. And so... That the, sounds terrible. It's, te it's terrible. Someone yeah. should do something about that. Yeah, web <laughs> asking is awesome. Uh, no, so... What's, I mean, what's terrible is that make, JavaScript is, is fast, but the performance of a language like JavaScript comes with um, unpredictability. Browse, uh, engines have to make harder and harder bets about, about things that are likely to be fast, and if their bets are wrong, you, you fall down a crazy cliff. So it, it could be that V8 says, you know, we're going to bet on you. Uh, so this turns out to be something all, browse, all engines do, but you, V8 says you have to instantiate all your properties inside the constructor of a function. Uh, you have to, you know, instantiate... The, if you make a new object, you have to uh, add all the properties in a particular order. And maybe, you know, Firefox will say you have to use class syntax. Uh, it's actually the opposite. Is more likely um, V8 was really looking at class syntax to make things faster. And, and maybe someone else will say, no, we really want to use constructors. Um, and, and that's that's just because uh, when you're, you're you're looking at JavaScript, JavaScript doesn't tell you what you're doing. They're sort of trying to guess. They're making their best guess effort. And making your best guess effort means that. If you're wrong, you, it can be really expensive. You're making really expensive bets, basically. So anyway, the, the point that I'm making is um, sometimes you can get better performance by taking some, by effectively taking some, something that you have on the server side and saying, OK, we're going to emit code that we know has the right performance characteristics today, or we're going we're gonna, to you know, carefully step around these minefields that you might step on if you were, uh, if you were just a regular programmer. And you can often do that without changing the programming model much, uh, just by sort of knowing what the engines are, are doing. The thing about transpilation in that particular context um, is the web isn't just JavaScript. And an app isn't just data munging code. It's not just computation. If uh, all you were doing was translating from C++ to JavaScript, some um, algorithms for doing vector computation um, on the back end, then sure, why not? I guess you're probably as likely to succeed with that as, as anything else. Where you get into a lot of trouble is when people are like, well, I got a bunch of C++ programmers around. They can make websites, sure. In fact, really awesome websites. In fact, I know we'll do CAD apps on the <laughs> web starting from C++. How about that? That's a terrible idea. Yeah. That's really, that, and, and not, because C++ programmers aren't super smart, not because languages don't have certain primitive fundamentals that, that can be mapped onto each other, but because the web is a domain, is a really unique domain. Interface is a domain. And what doesn't map directly from C++ in particular to JavaScript in particular is the DOM, is CSS, 
is how do you create great user experiences and make something that is usable and performant within the particular characteristics of this render context. And nothing that you can do in a transpiler is going to account for all of that complexity. You can account for some of it in a very simple way, and we've all seen those apps, and most of us don't use them very much. Yeah, I, I sort of talked about this in my talk this morning, right? Like Flex did this. Flex basically yeah. said, "You're not going. You're going. We're going to start from scratch. You're going. We're going to give you a drawing context. You're going to draw in it, and it's going to be the same everywhere. And then you're, you know, you get your select box. I was just uh, checking into Lufthansa this morning, and they, their select box is still a Flex select box, and it's like. The, the scroll wheel doesn't work, and it's like, I'm like, just give me the native select box. I want the one from my, my browser. And I think that's, the, that's sort of the point that you're making, mm -hmm. is that you, if, you, if, you just take, if you take C++, which just has a drawing context, right. and just splat some stuff on the screen, yeah, it will probably look on the screen the same way that it looked before, but it, will lo it won't feel native. It won't feel like it's, it belongs. Um, even if you look at, like, any any like Photoshop, any mm -hmm. any tool like that, they spend a lot of time making it feel correct for the you know, small number of platforms they support. And so if you just take Photoshop, like imagine you take Photoshop for Windows and put it on the web, and then you try to use that on OS X, mm -hmm. it's gonna feel terrible, right? There's a great phrase uh, about uh, desktop Java. Anybody ever heard that, that phrase before? Um, and the thing about Java is supposed to be write once, run anywhere. And the, 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 the slogan for desktop Java is write once, feel wrong everywhere. <laughs> um, not because Java is not a good language, but because when you're talking about user interface, user interface is this unique domain and it has its own concerns and you need to address those concerns. So there are people doing some interesting things like React Native. And you're trying to take JavaScript, which is an interface focused language and you have people who are specialized in the realities of that and of how you make good interfaces for real human beings and converting that into a relatively similar environment that's also designed to build interfaces for human beings. The concerns match up, the domains match up. Um, and I think you have a much better shot at, particularly when you're building a dedicated framework for that. So if there was somebody who was d building a dedicated framework for translating C++-based interfaces to good JavaScript-based interfaces, and that was a world-class framework because they understood that domain at both ends, then great. But that's, that's the mistake that I see people make, is they try to reuse something from somewhere else that just doesn't get the web, doesn't get interface, doesn't get the realities of this context. Um, and it's, it's a short-term win and a long-term loss. And, and with React Native, you're still building an iOS app or you're building an Android app. They, don't, they actually tell you, like, you're going to get a lot of sharing in terms of the, the learning, like your, the knowledge of the right. React framework. Yep. But you're going to write an iOS app and you're going to write an Android app. And you're, you don't want to take, you don't want, I've used the apps that, that people write using PhoneGap where you're like on Android and you suddenly have an iOS back button. You're like, that is completely yep. not how this works at all. Right. Right, and and I think that to React Native's credit, they realize this, and they're not trying to do. Uh, we'll just have some C plus plus code and make it look the same everywhere. Mm -hmm. That is indeed terrible. So Good. we have another question. Uh, yeah. So my question might take a little longer to ask. So it's basically, um, I've, uh, I mean, uh, for the last two days, uh, it has been a lot of knowledge and uh, from different sessions. So. Now I'm seeing you, uh, all of you together, so I, I'm uh, kind of recapping what happened. So Douglas uh, focused, I know, more about the security on the web, <clears throat> you know, upgrading that and proposing a new system where the protocol is can be, you know, web colon. Uh, Joe was, um, you know, he introduced about uh, WebGL and 3JS. So he was talking about this, you know, one of the possibilities uh, web can enter to, you know, virtual reality, gaming and all. And uh, Yehuda today morning, um, he was uh, talking about, you know, uh, the key to uh, scale is the isolation. So, like, putting these all things together, so can we have, you know, from the browser uh, developers, so can we have a system like, you know, dedicated implementation for game, like uh, web colon, one of the URL. Another URL could be media colon. Another URL could be, you know, <clears throat> something like separating the concerns. And this way, browser will be, you know, OK to scale as per the use case, as per the technology. Will this kind of idea do any good for the web, you know, over long term? 
you want to take that one, Doug? We're trying to do everything with a platform that wasn't designed to do virtually all of the things we're asking it to do. And we're frustrated with it. With the web stack is so deficient in so many ways that's putting a lot of pressure on the standards to try to, to fix it in order to turn it into something that, that's usable. But the problem with that is that standards are not where innovation should happen. And whenever we put innovation into a standards, we see W3C doing this all the time, ECMA does it too often, you end up with bad standards. And then that increases the complexity without adding much value and ultimately makes the problem worse. The best place to do innovation is in the libraries and in the frameworks. That the, um, the good thing about the web is that it's programmable mainly in JavaScript. And most of what is seriously wrong with the web, we've been able to repair there. And I think that's going to be the way forward. So that we should be demonstrating as much as we can at the library level. And when we have proved it there and when we've got consensus that we've figured it out, then it is appropriate to start thinking about how do we turn that into a standard. Yeah, I, I totally agree with that. Um, I think I basically could have no disagreement with that position at all. Um, I think it's really easy for, uh, I think Google is, does this a lot, actually, where it's like, okay, we have this problem. A lot of people have this problem. We have come up with a solution, and we want to put it on the web so everyone can have access to it. But the problem is that those, the, that, the, you know, Google's solution is really not any, doesn't have any more likelihood to be the right solution than a solution that comes out of Facebook or, you know, a community solution uh, like the ones I work on. And so the, the better thing for standards to work on, and this, is, this has been actually the entire debate really about web components, has been uh, the web component story started out with like really high level stuff. Actually, the original web components had a thing called MDV, Model Driven Views in, a, in it, which was a, a, a data binding system, sort of like Angular 1. Um, and they eventually were like, wow, that is too, but we can't, we don't, we're not going to do that. Um, but that was really where it started out. And Eventually, slowly over time, we've been able to get web components down to more and more primitive stuff. But that, that shouldn't be how it works, right? The way, the way it should work is that you say, okay, what is, the, what is the reason that this is not repairable in JavaScript or repairable using libraries? Um, a good, CSP is a good example of something that you just can't do in libraries. So CSP, the content security policy, allows you to ask the browser as a programmer to give you a subset of the platform that's saner. And, and you can do a lot of stuff. You can say like no third party scripts. You can say no inline scripts. You can say uh, no inline CSS. These are all really good things to want to do as a person writing an application. Um, and so, uh, but those are things you can't do as a, uh, you can't do that programmatically. So um, we needed to add something to the platform. And that, that was a, a pro somewhat appropriate use of, of standards effort to sort of pare down the platform to something sane. Um, and, and there's a lot, I think every single time uh, someone comes up with a, a big idea, a, a great idea for how we can make everything better if only everybody did this big thing. The, the smart thing to do is to pare it down into something primitive, into something small that people in, the, in framework land can use to try to repair the problem. Instead of trying to say, let's spend the next you know, five years, web components are like going on five years now or something like this. We, we, we shouldn't spend five years trying to push through this really high level thing. Um, we could easily have shipped, as Doug said about yes, yeah, we could easily have shipped smaller bits of web components years ago if we hadn't tried to do something so massive. We have a question here. Sure. Hi. So, um, so as uh, like um, Zuckerberg uh, uh, said that all the like most of the Facebook users, like around 80% users on Facebook are from mobile app. And uh, like recently uh, in India, uh, one of the biggest online store uh, called Mintra.com, they shut down their desktop app and they went mobile only. And same is gonna go happen for Flipkart, as the rumor said. So, you know, all, since all of these uh, like uh, consumer apps are going mobile or maybe mobile only, and uh, are, like in the last two days, we have just talked about, you know, doing the SWOT analysis of the frameworks, but what kind of apps do we envision will, will actually become norm of the web, as in which will be developed for the browsers? If we are not d making video games, then uh, I know Facebook uh, and Gmail and 
and LinkedIn, these uh, they they already had a browser app and then they went mobile, right? If if there's a new app that will come in future, they might not even build it for the browser. So. Uh, um, I know that with the, with, the, with the existence of React Native and Node.js and MongoDB, I have a reason to live, but what kind of apps we are building for the future? People are going to go where customers are. Um, and, and so a lot of this you know, move to an app only um, kind of thing just has to do with particular markets, with particular user bases at a particular point in time. And so I work in countries where signing up for new telecom service is 70% uh, people using desktop and laptop browsers. And there are, we've got other countries we operate in where people signing up for telecom services, 70% mobile only. Um, and that reflects the different demographics and preferences of, of those countries and sometimes where they are in their development. So I don't think there is any one global overall answer to that question. The interesting thing is that a lot of mobile apps truly are still being built with web technology. Even some very large companies are using a lot of web technology. Even stuff that we call a mobile app, or sorry, a native app, is actually a very good percentage of um, HTML and light JavaScript because rendering content in HTML is a lot easier and more flexible than doing it in 100% native constructs. So even when we say that a given company that you know, takes a lot of traffic has moved to an app, um, sometimes we still mean the web. We still mean web technology, web skills. Um, it's just now in this, you know, on this different device that people think is really neat right now. And, you know, 30 years ago, people thought digital watches were really neat. And how many of us in the room are actually wearing watches instead of looking at our cell phones? Um, so it's ebbing and flowing. We, we see a lot of, it's country by country, it's market by market. Um, and there'll be certain kinds of relationships like Uber. People don't call Uber um, or a taxi service all that often from their desktop because so often when you're doing it, you're on the move, you're out shopping, you're eating dinner, you know, it's, it's, it's life. You need to do it with you. Um, then there are other things that you just inherently like to do with a larger screen and a full keyboard and stuff like that. And it's going to continue, you know, separating. You're going to have a little of each. Some experiences are going to be desktop focused. So are going to, some are going to be app focused. I don't see any, there's no apocalypse. There's no web apocalypse just around the corner. So on the flip side of the Uber example, when I send a, I think people underestimate the, the sharing aspect of the web. Um, mm. And in particular URLs, every single time I see like, this happens now like at least once a year, some big company announces app linking initiative for mobile platforms. So it's like Facebook and Google and whatever. It's like, how do you deep link inside of a mobile app? Um, and at the end of the day, uh, People don't want to deep link inside of a mobile app. They want to use URLs. Um, they, they, in particular, want to use URLs that work reliably across all devices. So they, they don't want a URL that works. They, you, you, you know, if you send an email out with a, a link to Twitter on it, you don't want to send out a, you know, a Twitter um, protocol handler URL that only works on iOS. You want to send out a URL that works on Android. And I actually really like the fact that on Android, um, the way that, that uh, apps work is that they capture regular URLs. So if you, you know, if you have the app on, the regular URL that you got with e via email or any other text uh, content works. And if, if you don't have the application, then you just go to the, your, your mobile web browser and that will work also. And I think, uh, so I think that's a way better model than the iOS model of like, you, you either go to a web browser or you have a protocol handler and those two, were, never the twain shall meet. I think that basically doesn't work at all. Um, but, I, but I think if you look at, for example, when, when I want to send my wife on Uber uh, a, a link to where I am, that actually gives you a web URL that goes to a web uh, website, a desktop website actually, mm -hmm. that shows you on a map where I physically am as I'm, going, uh, as I'm driving. And I think, again, I think with all, of people, well, all the doom and gloom about, about web applications, um, whether on mobile or on desktop, people totally miss the fact that the web is still the way that you can share in, in a ubiquitous way. Mm -hmm. And uh, you see, 
there's all, there's all this talk about like the web is so far behind native, the web is never gonna catch up to native, and I, every single time I see one of these like uh, app linking, deep app linking initiatives, I wanna say like, when is native gonna catch up to the web? Right? And that, doesn't mean, that doesn't mean that the native is worse than the web or the web is worse than native. It mm -hmm. means that web and native have their strengths and we spend so much time, we, we, the web, web people like to beat ourselves up. We spend so much time complaining about the things that are not good at the web, about the web and then we don't spend a lot of time thinking about the fact that even, uh, even digital magazines that are designed for the web, that are designed for, uh, for tablets, right? So there was, uh, there was the Daily, which was a digital magazine that was tablet only. If you wanted to share something, what did you do? You didn't share a link to the tablet app. You shared a link to a special website that they built and its entire purpose was to allow you to share the content because you, they, they knew that they weren't gonna get away with saying you have to have an iPad if you wanna be on the receiving end of sharing this content. So in this, in this way, uh, people saw that example as, a, as a, a really good example of native winning. Look how native has won. But, but then when they actually went to build the experience that they needed to build, native was, simply wasn't up to the task. They needed to use the web as a sharing vector. And people just forget this. Every, you know, every, pretty much any application that is, web, that is mobile only, that involves sharing of any kind, ends up sharing a URL that points you at a website. And I think people just, people, uh, again, we like to beat ourselves up. Yeah. I don't think it's either or, and I think a lot of the companies that go app only will, as they grow and get bigger and stronger, they'll realize that they're missing out on some things and, and they'll, they'll have a web presence as well. Yep. Um, I, I think it's, it's a good way to conserve cash, it's a good way to direct your talent, um, focus them on just you know, delivering one experience. Um, makes perfect sense from a business perspective, but once you've won, uh, made a lot of money doing that, you're probably gonna want the people who you can reach better uh, through, through the web. Yep. So I think we have time for one more question. Uh, actually, too, we have oh. a question from one of our attendees on live streaming. Oh, perfect. Cool. Hi, I'm Hemant and uh, I wanted to elaborate more on this uh, topic which is going on. Um, it's been a good conference and I've learned a lot of interesting stuff. And the thing is that in this part of the world, it's a mobile first world, right? How do you see JavaScript evolving specifically in the mobile first world? And do you think that uh, there's a lot of scope for JavaScript compared to native apps? JavaScript is a programming language. You know, and it, it's a general purpose language. It can run in any environment and it can do pretty much everything as long as you don't push it too hard. So um, I don't see that JavaScript needs to change. If you're talking about making the web more effective in mobile applications, then the web needs to change a lot. It needs to get uh, much more efficient. M much of the performance issues that people have with JavaScript is really not JavaScript at all. It's with the way the browser works and the way the network works and misusing of that stuff. And making JavaScript infinitely fast is not going to change the character of most applications. So it, it's a much more complicated thing than that. I'm hoping that the web continues to get better at managing its own performance. But when you see us pushing on JavaScript performance and ignoring the rest of the web, then that indicates that we're not addressing the problem correctly and we're not gonna make progress. Yeah, I, I totally agree with that. I, I think that, that was maybe one of like the, perhaps shouldn't have been a surprise, but was anyway of React, was basically that JavaScript had gotten so fast compared to the platform that doing like ludicrous things in JavaScript were and, and to, in order to save minor amounts of work uh, in the DOM ended up being massive performance wins. And um, I think React people sometimes think that the solution is, um, I, guess, I guess what I would say is uh, there's a lot of room to improve the DOM. Um, mm -hmm. and, there's a lot, and there's a lot of room for alternate, alternative models, um, better primitives. Mm -hmm. uh, but I, I totally agree that uh, the, th the things that are slow, like JavaScript is sufficiently fast, except if you hit a cliff. JavaScript is sufficiently fast that if, you, if you're trying to figure out how to make uh, the web run faster on mobile, uh, making JavaScript twice as fast is not really the story. The, yeah. Whenever you, like I think React and, and Ember, when I, so when I actually first started working on Glimmer, which is the, the rendering engine that ended up being like, you know, it's like 50 times faster or something. Um, which is like a ludicrous thing to be able to say. But if you looked at React and Ember uh, a year ago, you would see that React was like many 
10x faster than, than Ember. And one of the th when we started, people would say, people said to me, um, uh, look at the profile. If you look at the profile, it's like all these things happening in JavaScript that are, spa that are taking so much time. And what we need to do is we need to make the things that we're doing in JavaScript take less time. And I said, no, I actually, what you need to do is do less things. And I think, and that's sort of the, I think the, the idea is that you wanna, you don't, if you're trying to make things run faster, um, the idea is not, well, what if we can make JavaScript 50% faster or even 5x faster? You're not gonna get as much mileage out of doing, uh, versus doing like 100 times fewer things, mm -hmm. which is, uh, and, and that maybe sounds pie in the sky crazy, but it is indeed what React uh, did and what, what Ember copied. And there's, there's room for more, more where that came from. I think there's a, a, real, a, a big uh, um, unexplored frontier around CSS. Um, someone yesterday mm. uh, talked about the CSS triggers thing. C the CSS triggers thing is like perhaps the, the next big foot gun frontier of things that make the web slow for not any good reason. And uh, wait, there's a lot of people thinking about ways to, to try to make that less of a foot gun. Um, and you could easily imagine sort of in the same way as CSP opting into a model that doesn't let you blow your foot off as much. Um, and, and so I, I agree, I, I agree that what we really need if we wanna make the web faster is to, I, I think we could put our foot off the gas of making JavaScript faster um, and spend a little more time on um, interactions in, in DOM, interactions in CSS, mm -hmm. interactions in painting that make things really slow. In mobile in particular, I think some of the things that we're talking about to the extent that we can say that the equivalent the exact same code rendered on a desktop versus the exact same code rendered, uh, computed um, on a mobile device is slower and is noticeably slower. That's a temporary phenomenon. Um, Moore's law applies to mobiles the same way it does to everything else. Well, I, Moore's law no longer applies to desktop, but it does apply to mobile. Well, right, right. which it still means that to mobile. More, like here is desktop and mobile. It's just a matter of time before mobile hits the Moore's law limit. Also, right. And, um, so there, it's still catching up. Stuff that uh, we take for granted today on desktop was prohibitive performance-wise uh, not that long ago. There were times when Gmail, wow, it's kind of kind of pokey, kind of slow. I don't know if I want to do my this whole web, this whole email on the web thing. That's kind of crazy, isn't that? You know, that's never going to take off, right? Who's ever going to use that? Um, and so it, I, I think some of these differences are short-term and a little bit temporary. Um, and there are people like uh, the Firefox, Firefox OS um, that are still trying to do an entire OS, or at least the user land parts of it, in JavaScript, the whole thing. Um, so yeah, JavaScript isn't going anywhere. It's not getting smaller. It's just getting bigger. And people, where's our NodeBots team? Where are they? There are guys creating robots with uh, who wish they had the processor of a, of a high-end, uh, Smartphone and they or even made a low end smartphone, or right? even a low end smartphone, and they made a robot with it that runs entirely on JavaScript, and it's running around taking pictures of people. Um, so yeah, I, yeah. I mean, so TZ39 actually recently DC decommissioned. There was used to be a compact profile, and every so often we'd get a big company coming and saying, "Hey, so you like you last you last released a compact profile like 10 years ago? What's going on with that?" And every single time it would come up, we would say, "Well, you know, this research team or that research team." Um, has been able to run the whole JavaScript in you know 200k or something. Mm -hmm. So it seems like we don't need we don't need a special compact profile just to run it on, on uh, small devices, mm -hmm. and and I and and that's true, right? You you can see very very low end devices now running JavaScript. So I, I don't think I don't think it makes uh, the com the problem with the compact profile is that compact profiles mean that when you're going in to use JavaScript, like there's the Java compact profile. When you go to use the Java compact profile, you have to learn a whole new language effectively. Mm -hmm. um, and a lot of libraries that you might want to use don't work anymore. And, and I think the nice thing about JavaScript is that even with all the bells and whistles, pretty much it still can be run in a relatively compact. Yeah. Okay. So we have a final question from yes. the live stream, I believe. Yes, so the question is that we are talking about compilation on the server side. Uh, with JSPs and PHPs have been doing it for a long time, why are we trying to rediscover? So we're talking about like isomorphic JavaScript, um, where some of uh, your your yes. DOM, you know, some of your HTML is pre-compiled, and then okay. the rest of it is passed down to. Yes. So we are talking about compilation of the templates on the server side, right? Yeah. It's becoming trendy now. Yep. But JSPs and PHP have been doing it for quite long. Why would we like to rediscover that? Anyone? I'll take it. Uh, 
Yeah, so people ask this question. This, the Rails community has people that ask this question. But I think it's fundamentally missing, a, a, to me, a pretty obvious point, which is that um, the reason people are running templating engines on the client, uh, and templating engines these days are, are, are really, are actually quite secure, much more secure than trying to, to munch strings together either on the client or the server. Um, they're pretty advanced. The reason people are doing that is that in, as, net, as networks have become more and more ubiquitous, so as more and more people have access, billions of people now have access to networks, it's not, that doesn't mean that billions of people have access to fast, stable, and reliable networks. What, what has happened is that as networking has gotten more uh, ubiquitous, it's actually gotten less reliable. So what's happened is, you know, uh, there's a great blog post someone wrote called the Prague Cafe Effect. Um, and the, the idea is you might be sitting in a cafe in some city and, and trying to access something, and if every single time you want to make a little interaction, you want to click on something, or you want to navigate to a new page, or you hit the back button, every single time you do that, you have to go back to the server and ask it to give you a megabyte, or even a few hundred K. Uh, that, that is really, really slow. It's not, it's not a little bit slow, it's basically unacceptably slow for, for many applications. And so the reason people are moving to the client side is actually not because the client side is trendy, and, and I would definitely say, if someone is using a JavaScript framework because they think it's cool, or because they want to tell their friends that they're using a JavaScript framework, definitely do not do that. Because they're, it's, it adds complexity to what it is that you're doing. But the trade-off for the cost is that you're running everything as close as possible to the user, right? So what's the fastest cache that you could possibly have is not a CDN. The fastest cache is actually running things in the browser. So that even if you have no network at all, and an example that I, use, I gave a few years ago and I, I haven't given recently is, um, if you use a native app, let's say you're looking at Twitter, and you go look at it, you have a list of tweets, you click on a tweet, and then you, you, know, you walk to the wrong side of, of your house and you don't have Wi-Fi anymore, you go under a tunnel or something, um, and you hit the back button. Now native apps, pretty much all the time, you get back to the thing you were looking at before. You see the list that you're looking at. Um, and pretty much, you know, a large majority of web apps, when you hit the back button, you see, if, you, if that happens to you, you see a spinner. You, you, or you see a white screen and you have to wait maybe forever. Uh, maybe you end up timing out. And the thing that client-side web applications give you is they give you the ability to uh, do stuff locally that uh, doesn't require server interactivity. So it allows you to decouple the things that really require server interactivity, which is things like getting a whole bunch of new data that you don't want to download all at once, or saving changes to the server. Those things require server connectivity. But uh, just showing the same piece of data in a different way, or showing something that you already saw before again, mm -hmm. those things don't require server connectivity. And really the only, the only way to do that is by downloading things. Now you could imagine a much more aggressive caching system where you know, you just cache the HTML that you saw before. But caching HTML, if you cache, imagine you are, you're going to Wikipedia and you cache the HTML of every Wikipedia page. That would be you know, orders of magnitude more expensive than caching the raw source and creating the Wikipedia page on demand as you navigate it around. So um, client-side web applications, people aren't doing it for kicks. They're not doing it because, I mean, some people are doing it because it's cool. But most people are doing it because it gives you a, gen, a, real, a real performance advantage over what they were doing before, right. and, and that's real. And so the, the, the case for why people are doing JavaScript applications is, is clear. Um, it's huge. Uh, you can just move faster, do more things. It's cool. So why are they doing isomorphic JavaScript on the server um, is, is the, the, the question. It, to me, it just boils down to two relatively narrow concerns, some of which may be a matter of time. First page render and um, search engines and uh, how, what you present to bots. So first page render is partially something that is, is being improved or that is limited by the, the very same limiting factors that Doug was talking about, um, deficiencies in how quickly we can retrieve data, whether we have to do that serially or in parallel. Um, those things are getting fixed, they're improving. That'll make the first page render issue partially go away. The other part of the first page render issue is just human nature. Um, people want it fast. If you make them wait three quarters of a second instead of one quarter of a second, some of them bail out. We don't know why. It seems to be a glitch in the human software. It's a bug. Um, and so we're, we're, we're working around that bug in wetware um, with this you know, first page rendering on, on the server side. And that's something that's getting half 
dealt with by better technology, and half maybe we'll have to do it forever. I think we'll do it forever, probably. We may do it forever. And if we do, though, it's not a repudiation of, it's not that, well, JSP was just as good a way of doing things. It's that 95% of what we're doing with client-side applications is the right answer. Um, if we can only just address this, this need that the user has for instant gratification um, on that, that first page render. And then the search engine side of it, I don't know, I think that's evolving. I think yep. that they're getting the ability to crawl our JavaScript pages and come up with the same results. We may have a, a long-term need to be able to control what they see, because the, the search engines may not crawl our JavaScript apps the way we want them to crawl our JavaScript apps. They may have different concerns. Um, and so, but that's a, that's, that's, a, that's a very specific, very narrow concern. Right? Once you've gotten the 95% of the value out of a JavaScript app that you get from rapid implementation, quick deployment, everyone in the world can use it in the browser, then you worry about the other 10%. And this is a, it's, an, it's a, the other 10% issue. So I think that's about all the time we have for this panel, unfortunately. Um, I want to thank uh, Christian, Yehuda, and Doug uh, for their time. I know we've um, got some great questions. And I'm sure the people watching live streaming as well took um, a lot of value from this. Um, I also want to take this opportunity to thank uh, the organizers of the conference. I think it's been really fantastic. I think they did, did a great job again this year. Um, and hopefully um, next year again it will be just as good. Cool. Thank you. Thank you, Joe. Thanks a lot, guys. Thank you, everybody. Can we have a big round of applause for the...